Iconic Marketing and Printing is your one-stop shop for premium banners, feather flags, vehicle branding, stickers, and much more. If you're looking to promote an event or build brand awareness, call us today on 223 2169 or 600 6887 at IMAP. If you think it, we can ink it. Get ready for a totally immersive gaming experience. Only three rules apply. You must be 18 years or older. Know your limit. Play within it. Blast. Lift off wherever you see the sign. The thing that needs the most care in the world is the skin of your baby. New Predo Baby. The skin of your baby remains dry with the extra dry green layer of Predo Baby. It keeps the wetness away from your baby's skin with its high absorbance capacity. The flexible sidebands of Predo Baby suits up completely the body of your baby. The textile exterior surface provides airflow and protects the skin of your baby day long. The cotton soft texture of Predo Baby gives peace to your baby. Predo Baby, the new diaper of the new generation. Distributed in Guyana by Saria Manufacturing Inc. There are trepid. Easy, and there are trepid. Easy, and there are trepid. Flavor up life with remix magic moments vodka. Tired of changing your baby's clothes? We have the perfect solution. Sleepy denim diapers, giving you that fashionable denim look throughout the day with the same soft touch. Look cool, look hip, rock in style with sleepy jeans. Distributed by Surya Manufacturing. It's just too good to be true. Can't take my hands off of you The way you make me feel I can't believe it's for real It's just too good to be true I love Bang Shandy Nothing tastes so good You love Bang Shandy Tastes like a Shandy should I want my Shandy It's just too now good to be true Now available in five true. exciting flavors And in green return well bottles Hello, good night. Welcome to Petroleum 101 here on Kaito Radio. My name is Kimal King and I'm your host and it's a pleasure being here with you for yet another edition of the show. Now, Petroleum 101 focuses on Ghana's oil and gas sector and you can tune in to understand the basics and the technicalities of this lucrative sector every Monday at 7.30 p.m. right here on Kaito Radio at 99.1 and 99.5 FM. Joining us in studio this evening are two executives from the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry. We have the Senior Vice President, Mr. Timothy Tucker, and on, on his left, we have Mr. Richard Rambaran, who is the Executive Director at the Chamber. And tonight, we're going to be talking about barriers to doing business in a budding petrostate. Now, Kaicho Radio has chosen to have this conversation against the backdrop of the fact that the World Bank has released a report showing that Ghana's business environment, it may be doing a bit poorly and there's a lot more that can be done to improve the ease at which businesses can operate in this country. We're also going to be getting into a conversation a bit about local content and barriers to trade in the CARICOM region. So, um, good night, gentlemen. Uh, good night, Kimo. Thank you for having us. Now, let's open this conversation by talking a bit about the businesses that are under the, the umbrella of the GCCI. I want you to tell me, uh, could you give an assessment right now of those businesses' level of preparedness for petroleum production? Well, the level of our business, uh, our members for petroleum production, um, I wouldn't say that if you're looking at petroleum production, as you um, speak in terms of where we are and how we can contribute to that, um, I don't think a lot of our businesses are to the to the tier one 
expectations. Mm -hmm. But um, in a wider context of what is needed and where we are, they are the low hanging fruits that our businesses can take up immediately. We know transportation services, logistic services, and a number of other, um, I should say, subcontracted work that we can um, take up at the moment. A lot of our uh, members have been ISO certified, have gone through some of the training. Um, we have quite a bit of members to them, even though we, the chamber itself, um, mm -hmm. have, I think, both up, um, I think two of the four operators as members yes. and a few of the tier one subcontractors. We're, this, we're talking about what local businesses that are part of the chamber because we also have, an, um, the chamber has several different categories of businesses. So we have from large businesses all the way down to small businesses. So at that, having said that, you know, we are able to um, do work at any level. Uh, the chamber membership can do work at any level throughout this in the sector because, as I said, we have from operators right down to caterers as part of um, our membership. Mm -hmm. yeah. Kimal, um, thank you for that question. I think what's important for us to understand from a very elementary level is what the Chamber of Commerce is, mm -hmm. um, and then we can begin to build out to understand the different factions um, or the different groupings that exist as it relates to business, the business services. Um, so the Chamber of Commerce is the oldest and largest business support organization in Guyana. It was founded in 1889, and we're actually the only business support organization mandated by legislation. Chapter 8903 of the Laws of Guyana established the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry. So the organization has been around for 130 plus years, um, has endured quite a bit. Um, over the past few years, um, particularly let's say the past eight to nine years, the chamber has accumulated quite a, a large uh, number when one looks at it relative to business support organizations within the country and across um, the geographic spread of Guyana. Um, we're upward 300 members. We have roughly 309, 310 members, and they span all sectors, all six main sectors, now the seventh sector, the nascent petroleum industry, um, and they are all sizes. So one would find a sole proprietor right up to a large manufacturer in the Chamber of Commerce. And as such, with that being said, um, one cannot say that there is a degree of homogeneity in terms of the readiness or preparedness for the oil and gas sectors. There are obviously entities in the chamber that are more prepared than others, some that have been around for a longer time, further along the learning curve. Um, they, they obviously have more technical experience and greater capacity, um, but there are a number of members in the in the Chamber of Commerce in excess of 20% of the membership that are actually looking and observing the market. They're actually involved in the, in the sector, um, whether it be bidding for contracts, whether winning or not. Um, so a number of the members are in and around the petroleum sector. And as you are well aware, um, the petroleum sector, there are a number of periphery sectors also. So it's not just that one is only operating in the sector, but also right. the spin-off uh, areas that may arise as a result of the sector. Now, Mr. Tucker, you mentioned low-hanging fruits in the sector. Could you distinguish for the audience between what this low-hanging fruit entails and what are the more difficult um, the more difficult ones would be the, the stuff that, um, you remember Guyana, it's only been four years since we discovered oil. Yes. And there will be a number of things that we cannot do, right? We will not be able to do the work of the Holly Burtons and the Saipans and um, the Technique, uh, which are laying pipes, um, drilling wells, um, connect, doing the connected the uprisers. There's no way that we can do those things. And the fabrication, the, on the, the underwater um, motor vehicles, uh, remote vehicles, those are things that we cannot do. What we can do is provide chandlery services, um, provide labor, um, we can provide uh, logistical services, we can provide transportation services, uh, we can provide a number of other uh, smaller and more gettable stuff that we can get ourselves ready quicker 
than getting to that level because those companies you're looking at companies that I called earlier that are over 100 years old right and a sector that is quite old so it's going to take us a long time we are well aware of that um, but there are the, the opportunities there and I think that's one that is one of the major problems uh, that there is out there that not enough information about the low-hanging fruits mm -hmm. are being exposed to the public so that we as business pe op business people in Guyana have the opportunity to develop businesses or young entrepreneurs have the ability to go out and say listen this is a part of the sector that we can probably just raise the bar raise the standard of our existing businesses and provide services to these sectors hmm. okay sure now how long would you take how far down the line do you think it would take for our local businesses to develop the capacity to do more oil sector specific work and what would it take to empower them to get there we will have to invest a lot in training but more so the, the, with the absence of local content um, policy or legislation right um, which local content policy or legislation would force businesses that are coming into the country to partner with local people to bring us up to the capacity almost right away mm -hmm. to service that sector but the transfer of knowledge when those partnerships or joint ventures take place right will be a matter of week in five or ten years depending on how the partnerships are formed yeah. the possibility exists that we can those things can rub off and then when this when the petroleum sector like everything else in the world um, things end and it becomes not feasible to do it anymore and the everybody packs up and leave we have companies locally that now can go to our neighbor, by that time I hope that they got their stuff together, uh, Venezuela, they have tr over 300 billion barrels of oil. You would have local companies that have the capacity to go and work into that sector or provide services here for those neighboring countries. So you, the, this is where really and truly local content, this is why the private sector has been pushing for that mm -hmm. so that you can get us up to scrap fast, scratch faster than it, what mm -hmm. it would take. Because if to answer your question, how long it would take, uh, would be almost impossible because me, my, I myself, don't know how long it would take me to be up uh, um, doing the work that they, they have done because they've been in business over 100 years. Right. Yeah. yeah, just, um, I, I think, Kimal, in understanding this, this, this phenomenon um, that has beset the local private sector, one has to look at it from a, from a dual perspective. Um, one, there is an organic rate that one can reach um, doing doing uh, work in the petroleum sector. And I'm talking here about high level work because as we have established earlier, there are certain quote unquote low hanging fruits that mm -hmm. one, can, uh, one can address. But I'm talking here about more advanced type of work. Um, there is an organic way we can just leave it and over the years we will develop that and people will learn, etc. But there is an accelerated way and this is the way that business support organizations such as the Chamber of Commerce and the roles of government to accelerate uh, businesses and business development in a country. Um, local content is certainly one, and when persons hear local content, they oftentimes, they oftentimes think about just giving an entity or giving a local entity first consideration or perhaps um, you know streamlining or targeting numbers for employment or for contract awards, etc. But there's a critical component of local content called technology transfer and skills and training development that Timothy alluded to earlier. And this type of arrangement can aid in accelerating business development in Guyana. Um, and we, we can we can explore some more avenues of such. Um, so the timeline that that Timothy gave earlier. I think with uh, the approach of a joint ventureship, with the enactment of a local content policy, those two conditions um, could see high level of work being done in the sector, depending on the range of the, the technicality, within three years uh, to eight to ten years, thereabouts, uh, if we were to put tangible or material numbers to it. Um, and as you know, culture also plays a very important role in the rate at which a society learns. And I think that Guyana and Guyanese have proven themselves time and over to be 
fast learners, um, resilient people, and very eager to learn and to explore and to understand new opportunities that may arise in an economy. Okay. Now, we've had three local content policy drafts, and the Chamber has submitted comments on the third draft and suggestions on how it could be made more effective. What are the key suggestions that have been made by the Chamber to empower businesses to uh, eventually bring themselves on par with the Halliburtons of the world? So, thank you uh, for that question, and I think it gives a wonderful segue into the discussion of local content and entering into the uh, material or the substance of local content. Essentially, one has to understand for us the type of local content which the Chamber is advocating for, and we call it flexible local content or market-creating local content. It's one that doesn't, unlike uh, Ghana and unlike uh, Brazil and other countries that have rigid local content policies with targets, the Chamber is discussing a local content policy and advancing a local content policy which is uh, flexible in nature and it refers to first consideration for local companies. Um, now, if one observes what first consideration is, it's essentially if a local is providing a service, um, that, that that consideration should be given to the local company first before any other. Um, as is necessary, that would have to go hand in hand or be married with a competitiveness plan for the development of the local private sector. Because obviously, here you're talking about simply giving first consideration to local companies. How competitive you are is determined by a number of other factors, and that's where the discussion of the doing business index and so on comes into play. Um, but that's, that's part and, and parcel of the thrust of the local content policy that the Chamber has been advancing. Flexible, um, non-targeted, and one which has technology transfer written into it, um, one which has certain penalties for not abiding, not in a, a specific form, but more as a prescriptive measure. Because, um, of course, we would expect that legislation at some point in time within the near future would be enacted. Um, the paper that we have drafted on the third draft of the on the third draft of the local content policy is a short paper. It's roughly ten pages, mm -hmm. um, and it came out of discussions from the local content policy forum, which we held, um, as you are aware, where we had a number of stakeholders, person a persons asking questions, um, also discussions from our pet petroleum subcommittee, the technical subcommittee in the chamber that observes and, and analyzes the petroleum sector. So. Essentially, it's one that is a market-creating local content policy and one that is flexible in nature that allows for first consideration for Guyanese companies. So it talks about that, employment, technology transfer, and penalties. Those, those are the four, four main sections of our local content policy. Okay. I'd like to bring the conversation now to local content and how that intersects with other CARICOM states that want to come here to do business because they want to capitalize mm -hmm. on our Guyana's newfound patrimony. The Chamber has raised some issues about barriers to trade that have historically been put up against Guyana by our sister states. And you have also suggested that Guyana can, should now leverage its newfound patrimony to advocate for better conditions. Could you first describe the relationship between Guyana and, and the states that you've mentioned? I think it was Jamaica, um, Trinidad and Tobago and Barbados are the ones that you've said have put up certain barriers to trade that have disenfranchised Guyana. How would you describe our current relationship with those countries? Our trade relationship. I think specific. Timothy would be the best person to start that conversation <laughs> off. <laughs> so, the problem we have with trade and the trade in, in our interregional trade is that somehow Guyana um, has been been put at the bottom of the barrel and not been given a fair opportunity to get out of that barrel. Mm -hmm. um, 
our goods are deemed substandard, our services are deemed substandard, we as a people are treated substandardly and throughout the region. Um, and I think that because it's not, I wouldn't just want to limit it to those three countries because there's also the organization of Eastern Caribbean States, which is an organ, which is an organization within CARICOM that we can't even get access to. So you have those three countries that you would have mentioned just now, plus the organization of Eastern Caribbean States that are all have different things that over the years, it, I mean, in when CARICOM was set up, Ghana played an integral part of it, right? right? Um, it is something that Guyanese hold, I would say, very sacred in terms of our role that we played. But we have not been treated in that way. And what you're looking at is that over the years, even though they would have accepted some of these good um, products from us, and some of the, when we would have hidden hard times, they mounted serious trade barriers that stopped our products from going to, the, to, those, to those countries. Now, each and every one of them are flooding to Guyana. And they're coming here because we are open up. We have always been open. We have not put any barriers in place to block those people or those countries. And now that they're all here, they're using, I mean, they're basically also doing their own thing behind the scenes, so to speak, mm -hmm. where they're only trading with each other. Yes. They're again, they're in our country and doing that. And this is the problem that I, that I have, because when you look at what we have in there, I can give you the numbers, right? If you look at the trade numbers, the I think it's only Jamaica and St. Lucia, and we are at 1.7% of the exports. Trinidad in um, sends 35% of our imports is from Trinidad, All right? And you have, so when you look throughout the Caribbean, where the way our people move mm -hmm. throughout the Caribbean, we restricted, even though we had talented people to have job, fill jobs anywhere in the Caribbean. We, you know, the Guyanese work very hard. We are resilient. We are educated, but we are treated badly. And somehow we just cannot seem to get a reciprocal treatment, right? When, the way we treat everybody and our, we accept everything, and, but none of our goods are taken. And it's difficult because we've been ba fighting that battle for a number of years. Multiple governments have been through this uh, CARICOM. And the reason why we said that um, we called on the issues of CARICOM is because there are a number of um, judgments that have been passed against Caribbean nations by COTED and by CARICOM, and they just refuse to accept it. Um, I think there's only about four Caribbean nations that even acknowledge the CCJ or signed on to the CCJ. That's right. And that's the problem. When you go to the CCJ, mm -hmm. you still they, they still don't accept the full. They would appeal it to the privy. Mm -hmm. Council and plenty of different things. So the way it's situated, uh, we are saying, stop, let's take a look at it and see if it's working. Because everybody's coming here. Suddenly, I, I think the rate is going. Um, we might be um, a minority. Guyanese might be a minority in Guyana. Yeah. Very soon, the way it's going. So at, it, it's you have to protect the Guyanese people, every negotiation, everything that you do from now forward, whichever government leads us after the next election, they must start the conversation with what is Guyana and Guyanese getting first. Yeah. And then we work from that back. Okay. If, it, if you cannot do that, then it makes no sense being there. Mm -hmm. uh, no. uh -huh. I just wanna add one thing. I think um, if you want to start from observing I think Timothy started from a very good position, um, the nature of the relations. Let us observe inter-regional trade uh, with, with our sister countries. You could have rightly mentioned Jamaica is the only one that makes a line item. Um, to make a line item in exports, one has to have 2% or rather 1.9% of the exports of the country. Um, for one to not even make 1.9% of the total exports, but at the top um, of our import bill, 
one has to really observe whether there is fair trade and whether the trading relation, strictly based on numbers, um, is one that is fair. Because after all, what would one want for a country? Balance trade. That's the way that one will be able to balance the foreign currency, the movements of the foreign currency, etc. And even if we were to take a look anecdotally, outside of the statistics, outside of the numbers that we are faced with, um, one would see clearly, and Guyanese can tell you the stories and many of the horror stories about how they have been you know, treated as they approach different terminals and different uh, points within the Caribbean. So one has to ask if when we observe what is happening contemporarily, if we are truly being embraced only because, and if we are even being embraced at all. Now, as Guyanese and as persons within um, the the media um, and 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 the and the spheres to be able to influence, we have to utilize this opportunity. I always say to persons, this is a watershed moment in the trajectory of the development of the country, and if we are unable to utilize this opportunity to fix many of the existing problems, then when we look at them five years down, maybe ten years down. The opportunity might be passed because what op what might obtain in the landscape of the country may be a situation that you can't fix. So I think we have to utilize this opportunity. Now we have to leverage the advantage that has been given to us as a result of the discovery of our Guyanese natural, national patrimony and work towards fixing many of the problems that have arisen over the years as a result of unfair trade, um, on imbalance trade, etc. Let me just give you an example, right, of something. There is a, I think um, the former president of the chamber would have mentioned it the other day in the press conference, um, and it's something that I know personally. Um, there is a, the Ghana signed uh, in, I think it's 1990, or somewhere around that, or 19, in the 1990s, we would have signed on to the Montreal Protocol. Montreal Protocol, um, now it's the phasing out of uh, fumigant that is used to fumigate um, grain, prod produce, fumigate homes or whatever. It's called methyl bromide. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I think, in up to last year. So that would, is 17 years. right? So it would have been in the late 90s or the early 2000s, 17 years since the last set of methyl bromide would have entered Guyana. We would have since um, have that as a restricted use item in Guyana. Now, there's a number of other countries around the world that signed the Montreal Protocol, right? Including quite a few of our CARICOM um, brothers and sister countries. Now, it's me and you signing an agreement. You know that I signed the agreement. I know that you signed an agreement. But I'm telling you, that if you want to import, if you're sending something to my country, you have to fumigate it with metal bromide. Exactly. Knowing, fair, knowing fair and well that we both sign that, that we have to stop using it. Yes. So that is a barrier to trade. So now things like cassava, edos, um, quite a few number of the ground provisions and, uh, that are there cannot be exported to quite a few of the Caribbean nations because... We, they're saying that it has to be fumigated with methyl bromide, yet they can't use it in their country. All right, now. Um, we're going to take a quick two-minute break, and when we come back, we're going to get into... We're going to get deeper into this conversation. I'll ask these executives to talk to me a bit more about current um, barriers to trade. So back in a, back in a flash. Ways to enjoy meals, a well-done meat, three quarters or half. There are tastes for everything. Or what about chicken? Some love wings, others the thighs, and others the breast. Agreeing on which part is impossible because they're just like Coca-Cola, from everywhere and for everyone. Because, despite the differences, we will always come together to enjoy our meals with a Coca-Cola. No sugar. Better together. Coca-Cola. <sighs>
Tired of changing your baby's clothes? We have the perfect solution. Sleepy denim diapers. Giving you that fashionable denim look throughout the day with the same soft touch. Look cool. Look hip. Rock in style with sleepy jeans. Distributed by Surya Manufacturing. Drink and chew to the beat of Mogul Mogul with fun fruit flavors and real nata de coco bits. Mogul Mogul, you gotta chew. Distributed in Guyana by Surya Manufacturing Inc. Flavor up live with Remix Magic Moments Vodka. You're back here with Petroleum 101. I'm your host, Kimal King, and we're talking about barriers to business in a budding petro state. To have this conversation, we're joined here by the Senior Vice President of the GCCI, Timothy Tucker, and the Executive Director, Mr. Richard Rambran. Now, when you left us a few minutes ago, we were talking about barriers that are being put up by our sister CARICOM states to disenfranchise Ghana in terms of trade. I'd like to get a bit deeper into that conversation. Could you tell me a little more about current barriers to trade that are that are in place that may be disenfranchising Guyana in its efforts to participate in the oil sector? I know you held a press conference last week and you talked about how Trinidad has applied for um, there to be a waiver for the common, common external tariff for safety equipment. How can something like that put Guyana in a state of dis disadvantage? Well, the fact that um, there's a 40% common external tariff on most of the safety items that they would have listed. Um, Guyana, so a local businessman bringing, because we don't manufacture safety equipment, hard hats, safety boots, glasses, gloves, reflector jackets, um, overalls, um, well, I should say chemical and flame resistant overalls and a few other things. Um, now, you have those things and they're quite expensive safety equipment, proper good safety equipment. And you have them coming in, imported into Ghana, we would have to pay, um, I think, 40%. And then we pay 14% VAT on top of that. So that now, when that common CET is waived, to, is a, the waiver is granted to Trinidad and Tobago, they would um, now basically bring it, bring something in 40% cheaper than we can um, automatically. If I was buying stuff um, for the industry that is offshore, um, what is to say that I wouldn't buy it offshore, supply, equip all my men that are operating off of the shores of Guyana um, and have them equipped with cheaper safety equipment. Um, so basically, that puts us at a disadvantage and we would have um, said to the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that we think that Guyana should go on the coattails and apply for the same waiver um, so that of course we remain competitive. Now I, I'll give you some history on that. <laughs> Last year we were called to a meeting with Ministry of Foreign Affairs which we have a good working relationship with and um, there were a number of items um, that were going before the uh, ministerial um, the ministerial meeting for COTED. And there was a, a request for a waiver, waiver of household items. So in the meeting, we would have said, can we see the list of household items? And they had TVs, microwaves, and there was a number of items going down. And then in that list, there was safety boots, safety glasses, hard hats, all these things here. It was hidden away mm -hmm. in household items. And that is, so that is the level of deception that you deal with, right? And this is where we have the problem. 
where the, the, the local businesses, because we're sitting there with foreign affairs and then that is found by us. And these are the kind of things. I mean, we're looking at some of the barriers that we would have spoken about earlier. We were promised a year ago, Dr. Rowley came here when we, or a year and a half ago, when we would have said to the um, government at that time, do not sign any MOU with Trinidad until we get some of these barriers removed. We were told that we, we are fighting for agriculture sector and that we're dealing with the petroleum sector, so that it outweighs. There's more money in petroleum than there is in agriculture at this point in time, right? There are a couple of cases around the world we can prove otherwise. Now, <clears throat> yes, we know that, but how do you, we cannot as a country rely on one sector alone. And you cannot forsake all the other, the six sectors that we were dealing with and that we've been surviving on barely for all the years and forsake them for one new sector. Because majority of Guyanese people, the reality is, will never work or supply the petroleum sector with products and services, especially the way the, at the rate it is right now without any legislation. So th that has been established that that is the reality. So what do the rest of us do? We have to provide build our manufacturing sector. We have to do continue with our uh, value added for forestry and all these different things. Now, if you're looking at the ease of doing business, right, electricity is the main cost. Once we lower the electricity costs, we are going to be able to be competitive. We are not asking for the petroleum sector to subsidize any sector. That's, that's crazy to do because you would never know the true value and the true economic value of that sector if you're going to subsidize it. So you really and truly have to develop those sectors, but you have to, what, those sectors cannot give you the infrastructure. Petroleum financing will do that. So you can take the money that you're gonna earn from the petroleum sector and build better roads, access to markets, um, packaging facilities, um, all your road to the farming community. If you want, you can build up um, a refinery, um, lower the cost of fuel, lower the cost of uh, fertilizer, lower the cost of so many byproducts that all the other sectors need. Mining is fuel, um, mining, logging, um, because you're looking at transportation, you can build your road, your, um, you can build good deep water harbors, and you can, cr you can open up the possibilities for all the other sectors. But then you, I mean, the amount of infrastructure spending that you have to do for that, those sectors cannot build it. We, we haven't been able to do it over the years. So those are some of the issues that you have dealing with it and coming back to, um, to what, it, what is really happening here. You have them creating, I should say, trying to sneak in and get these levies removed. We caught them, then they came back now and they brought it to us. Yes. So we, have, we will say now, okay, fine. At least Guyana must have the same privilege because we want to be competitive too. And that's basically where we are when it comes to the um, the safety equipment and that we would have mentioned the other day. I want to bring a concept in here, Kimal, and it's something which within a regional agreement, within a customs union, a, a, a free trade area, and uh, when countries sign any treaties to have a free trade area, it's a critical rubric to have, and that is the notion of good faith and the notion of good faith negotiations and good faith behavior. The instances that Timothy have highlighted that have gone, those of uh, using the mechanisms within the, tra the trading area, um, you know, sneaking things in, um, putting up artificial barriers to trade and such the like, they are not uh, demonstrative of good faith behavior. And I think that is where uh, Guyanese are receiving the short end, right? We are not dealing with countries that want uh, or, or want to behave in a manner that is good faith. Um, and that is the beginning of tensions within 
any free trade area. If you look at those that have gone before, um, if you look at one of the reasons why the original federation would have collapsed with, uh, before CARICOM, if you look at what has been happening in the European Union and with countries exiting, etc., it is the, on the underpinning of it, it's not a technical or an economic concept or any development concept. It is one that is social of, of social psychology in nature, and that is good faith behavior. A country has to exhibit good faith when approaching negotiations table because we expect that we are in this union together. We expect that we are all here to aid in the development of the regional industries. And one has to ask or one has to question if that regional ethos has been in place for the past couple of decades. Um, we can highlight, we can sit here, Kimal, and highlight for the remainder of the night into tomorrow many of the barriers to in, uh, many of the barriers that have obtained in different sectors. And I think the agriculture sector is just one um, that we can have pellucid examples. You know, there was recently the entire case of duck hepatitis um, and the and the scare about that in the in, in the region, it has been proven that there are countries um, in CARICOM and even Trinidad themselves who impose the ban, who they themselves currently trade with countries that have proven cases of duck hepatitis. Guyana does not have a proven case of duck hepatitis. We have a suspected case. And what do we do? We do not send even a pound of chicken or a pound of duck to Trinidad at this moment. Now, one needs to ask once again the rubric that I brought into consideration earlier, the notion of good faith. Is that good faith? And when you know you hear the chatter in Trinidad, you hear that one minister might be operating outside of, 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 of another minister um, understanding or knowing. So these are the different issues that we are faced with, and they I want to just bring the focus back to the trade barriers. Obviously, there are certain natural barriers to trade that exist. For example, Guyana may not be as competitive as some other countries um, in terms of the level of infrastructure, the reliability and the quality of electricity, um, the incentives which are offered for local manufacturers, the fiscal regime, the economic stability of the country, amongst many other things. And those will obviously affect the competitiveness of the economy. And those we understand are natural barriers to trade. And those will take time and deliberate action on the part of government and private sector to improve. What we are very concerned about, however, from a private sector and a business development standpoint, are those artificial barriers to trade which exist. Let's go to honey, for example. In the region... Within the past five years, Guyana has had voted one of the best honey in terms of quality, in terms of texture, in terms of a number of different uh, areas. But have we been able to send honey? No. Why? There are old laws from 1936 that are being applied on the transshipment and the, and the arrival of honey into ports and around Trinidad. Um, and a number of these issues exist. So once again, I bring the concept into, into play. Good faith. Is it there? And I want persons and listeners and viewers to take uh, a keen consideration of this because this is the underlying and this is the root of it all. You're looking at, I mean, I know a lot of people will think, and, and, and like we were told a year and a half ago, how can you do the comparison? Mm -hmm. Honey versus... Again, look at our neighbors. Look at the state that of their economies because they solely rely on one sector. Trinidad would have subsidized their manufacturing sector um, with petroleum, cheap fuel, cheap electricity. Venezuela, yeah. look at the turmoil that they're in. We cannot rely on one sector. Yeah. And we have to be able to remove, use the sector that is at Guyana is now in a position that it, could, that it has the power and the weight right, to change things, open doors, 
meet the people that we were not able to meet. We are on the map. We need to remove those barriers to trade, get the doors open. We do not need people to come in here, set up shop, dummy shops hard, and shell companies to suck the revenue out of this country and leave nothing for the people who have been here, the 749,000 people that have been in this country struggling for the last 50 years, and suddenly the, the Caribbean and the world comes here and do not, and, and, at, and at some point completely disregarding the people that have been here, that have been struggling all the time. We have, I mean, and they're coming and they're getting land, they're getting, um, all the concessions and you have businesses that have been here in existence 40 50 60 year old companies that are not getting those um, deals that have been paying the taxes mm -hmm. and have been work and doing the, the and good corporate citizens and donating and contributing to everything from non-governmental organizations to political parties and have not been getting any concessions so really and truly we are asking that come on our government has to help the private sector like because that is what those barriers that you see that are being placed all over the um, Caribbean are there to protect the private sector in those countries that's the reason that they're there right yeah. just okay. just one 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 more point um, sure. on the on the importance of these other sectors um, and this is a, a pivotal point to drive home uh, to listeners and, and, and viewers. The petroleum industry is a very valuable industry. Mm -hmm. It will mammoth, it will be a mammoth compared to all of the other industries. But it is a capital intensive industry. It is one where relative to the investment size and the amount of machinery, etc., the capital, the, 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 amount, the number of persons that are being employed is small. If you look at at other industries, those of agro-processing, forestry, mining, uh, all of the other subsectors that are associated with those sectors, you find that they are not just strictly capital intensive, but they employ a fair amount of labor. And it is the employment of that fair amount of labor which provides income for the masses of Guyanese. So, there will be a lot uh, there will be a lot of money circulating in the economy within the next 5 to 10 years but how we are able to distribute that uh, income not just from a govern government or a governance standpoint in terms of uh, giving transfers or incentives to this etc but how we are able to develop other sectors and how we are able to keep persons uh, employed in those labor intensive sectors that will be one of the pivotal questions moving forward for Guyana. Okay, now, coming later this month, the GCCI has a gala. Oh, yes. And I understand that the former Prime Minister of Jamaica, Portia Simpson Miller, is going to be there. What do you expect her to say in relation to this issue? Mm -hmm. She's coming to speak on the relevance, I, I would say, um, she's coming and give her opinion on the relevance of CARICOM. That's what we would have asked her to come and speak on. Mm -hmm. She's a person with a wealth, she was former chair of CARICOM, so she would have had a wealth of experience on CARICOM. And mind you, um, some of the barriers that Jamaica is not, uh, was in a very similar position to us mm -hmm. um, in terms of the barriers that were placed on their businesses. They would have managed to overcome and get rid of some of those barriers and become one of the, um, I should say more successful nations in the, in in CARICOM. So um, what? How that transformation and what um, the process and what she thinks about that transformation is very key for us analyzing the relevance of CARICOM. So we thought it would have been very. Um, the president of the chamber is the one who um, made that decision, and I must say that it's a very. I should say. It's, future thinking mm -hmm. from the president of the chamber and clearly um, is very relevant at this time her coming her the conversation that we're going to have with her and uh, also I think at the event so the gala is on the 28th of um, November it starts at 6 30 cocktail hour and then dinner and the speeches um, the president will also in his speech outline 
um, the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce 10 point plan, or should I say industrialization plan. So he's gonna focus on 10 points that the, that the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and industry finds very important and is needed by any political party. And we're throwing, we will circulate it with the, all political parties so that they can see what the private sector or the chamber members would like to, to, to see in terms of development of this country. Um, so we're putting our wish list and it's Christmas. So we're <laughs> hoping that um, that's one of the political parties, if not all, picks up, picks up as much as possible of okay. our wish list. Yeah. Now, I want to move the conversation to the doing business environment. But before I get there, from the last press conference that the chamber held, I don't want to misinterpret what you folks said, but it, it may have sounded at one point like you were stopping short of saying you should leave CARICOM. We did not say, well, I did stop short mm -hmm. of saying leave CARICOM. Um, that is not a, we have to first analyze. We have these problems. Yeah. There are a number of CARICOM countries. They are, a, there's a subsector within CARICOM, which separates CARICOM. So when you have, you have a family and then you have a subsector in the family and then you have members of the family putting up barriers to deal with that family, then you stop and you have to analyze it and see, is my presence and my contribution to this family even worth it anymore? Does it make sense? And it has to be something that we, we look at in its totality and see if, if we are getting what, we were in, what our forefathers intended for us to get mm -hmm. when we created and, and took part and got involved in CARICOM. Are we getting what we are supposed to get? Is it being what it's supposed to be, right? Are we getting access? CARICOM, we know that Guyana has 700, under a million people. The CARICOM market is enough for us to develop, but we're not having access to it. So does it really make sense? Or should we start turning to other, other angles? Should we go to the South America angle? Should we go, you know, with more bilateral um, arrangements? We have quite a few bilateral agreements. Should, so should we start looking at that? And that is the analysis that needs to happen before I can say, Let's exit, Gary. Let's guy exit, so to speak. Yeah. I, I think Kimal, uh, Akira, that's a very um, interesting terminology. A very careful examination needs to be made of CARICOM and the net benefits that accrue to Guyana as a uh -huh. result of our, uh, our presence in CARICOM. Like Timothy has alluded to, I believe that there are a number of uh, benefits that could accrue to Guyana and uh, some benefits have been uh, been accruing to Guyana over the years. I don't believe that the regional development model um, is past its its usefulness. I do believe that there still is some usefulness in that mode of development. I think that uh, given the common history and given uh, similar similar circumstances which the countries were birthed out of, um, there does exist that and there is that common cultural identity as many Guyanese would know if they go to a foreign country and they meet a Caribbean person it's almost as if they're chatting with someone from home but like I said um, these are artificial barriers to trade which we have been talking about and it is not as if these barriers when removed will not bring benefit to Guyana and as such we would hope that our neighbors and our brothers and sisters in CARICOM would act in good faith to remove some of these artificial barriers and as such allow benefits to accrue. If benefits came all were not there for, 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 uh, to be accrued to the Guyanese economy, then the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry would not be fighting for them to be removed. Yeah. So there is tremendous economic benefit in CARICOM the private sector in Guyana, particularly the Georgian Chamber of Commerce and Industry and its members, have seen the benefit that can accrue to uh, the proper usage, the proper implementation, and good faith behavior within the CARICOM region. So 
I don't think that it's a matter of let's just put aside the, 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 the bat and the ball and pick up the wicket and let's go home. I don't think it's a matter of that. I think what we need to do is approach the table constructively and discuss in a manner with good faith where we are going to go and how do we go there. Guyana is one of the members of the CARICOM, country, of the CARICOM region that is classified as uh, an MDC, a more developed country as opposed mm-hmm. to an LDC in CARICOM. And as such, we do hold quite a bit of weight uh, in the Treaty of Shagaramas and, 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 and the, the, uh, the mechanisms which are offered to us. So we have to understand our role. Guyana has to begin to, and our leaders of the country have to begin to chart the, the, the new path for development for Guyana, given this newfound sector or on the heels of this newfound sector, and how, how we, uh, we make the landscape and how we design the architecture of the new Guyana um, and Guyana moving forward into this, in, into this uh, economy with this new sector is critical because we can't afford to make mistakes and go down the road that many other countries um, who have found uh, oil and gas have gone. Okay. Now, let's move the conversation to the doing business environment. The World Bank's report is a very broad assessment of how countries are doing. And Guyana has more or less gotten the same score that it got last year. But, um, you know, earlier this year, actually at the last press conference that you guys held, I heard Mr. Daegu Boyer, the president, talk about the customs and trade single window that you guys have been hoping for. Earlier this year, there was a customs and trade single window bill passed. So but my understanding when, when I was at parliament and I saw that passed was that... Um, the implementation, is it that the implementation has not effected? Because the law is there now. Mm-hmm. And when I heard him say that it's just lip service, I was surprised. I think um, his, he deals with customs and the single window and for the nature of his business. Mm-hmm. And he would, would have been the better person to answer his feelings and where he got that from. Sure. Um, but... I don't think that that single window is up and running. I think, um, and I think, as, as if you're gonna look at the doing, doing um, the ease of doing business index, um, I think there's a number of um, things that need to be put in place. In terms, I mean, when you look at it, you're coming. You're st- we did the George on Chamber of Commerce uh, held in September this year, its second business development forum, mm-hmm. and at our first business development forum, right in 2018. We would have put a roadmap to starting up businesses. So it basically, when I look at the World Bank and how they analyze it, you're looking at first registering a business, the pre-registration process and going forward, and how long that takes. Now you're looking at, to address a single window, you're looking at you're going, you have to go and register a business. So you wait and you get your registration, and your registration number, your business mm-hmm. registration number. Then you go to... Um, register a TIN certificate, your tax identification number. Then you have to go to your national insurance scheme number for your business. So that's three different places you had to go to get a number. Mm-hmm. Now, now that business has three numbers. Wouldn't it not be easier if you had Just one. one and you get one number and it cross, it crosses all three? So your NIS num- your business registration number is your NIS number your, and your business tax identification number. And that, of course, helps all three agencies to police it. It helps, it makes it easier. It creates a quicker process. You go into one office and you get all three. One number that covers all three. I'm regist- I now have a business and my business is registered with GRA. And NIS. Yeah. That would, how fast will that move you on that index? You know, yeah. so those are some of the small things that you need to do. I mean, and that's just dealing with the first index yeah. of the doing business. And yeah. I, I understand that Mr. Diodat Indar, I had spoken to him and he said that the issue is similar for 
construction permits where you have to hop from agency to agency to get a permit depending on the nature of the construction that you want to yeah. um, effect. Let me just, um, for the previous question on single window, um, it's a it's a number, it's a multi-dimensional project. Um, and Guyana is moving along that line. Mm -hmm. Where we are currently, to my understanding and to the best of my knowledge, is the implementation of the Asikuda world, which is a different customs uh, system, and we have moved away from the old one, TRIPS. Um, that is essentially supposed to speed up the customs process and essentially speed up the way that one obtains goods, etc. Um, so it is not just a unidimensional phenomenon it's not a unidimensional plan it is one that is multi-dimensional and i there are a number of issues and multiple layers that one would have to examine asikuda is only one it's only a software it's only a system and that's only one component of customs and clearing um, a single window is something that requires institutional capacity, it requires the right level of resources, it requires interagency coordination, it, in, it, it, it uh, requires persons essentially giving up territory, which has been a problem with agencies in developing countries. So there are a number of other uh, institutional developments that have to occur before the single window in full can take effect. Um, what we're talking about here, of course, is one single window for doing business. Like if you go to a counter and you want to do business, you have once uh, it's a one stop shop for doing business. Um, so, you know, there are a number of other areas as it relates to the single window, having the legislation in place, having a security, there are steps in the right direction. But there are other dimensions that have to be fixed um, before we can really begin to see the true benefit of the single window in in its form okay now at the helm of the city chamber i'd like to think that you will have a front row seat to um the major the most major difficulties that have weakened again in this index because i wanted to ask you to point out some of the solutions that you would say are low-hanging fruits for the government what are the quick solutions that government can put in place to improve Ghana's um, business environment performance. Mm -hmm. well, maybe, um, Kimal, it would be good for the listeners for us to just highlight what the different components of the doing business okay. I, index I, I, I are. I can do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm looking at it right here. It's, mm -hmm. it's starting a business. That's the first index that they look at. Yes. Uh, they're looking, dealing with construction permits. They've also dealt dealing on um, getting electricity, which we the last one. <laughs> <laughs> registering property, um, getting credit, protecting uh, minority investors, paying taxes, trading across borders, enforce um, enforcing contracts, and resolving I insolvency. Mm -hmm. Now, if we go well, we would have dealt with starting a business, and I would have said what I thought was a suggestion for reducing that time period for that. Um, dealing with construction permits is the second one, and you would have asked, and we all know that's a nightmare. Um, we have to run from several different departments back and forth to get permits. Um, now, based on the fact that Guyana is a very, there's a number of NDCs, you have, so you have to go to NDC, Central Housing and Planning, and then you would have to go to the Water Authority, and the fire service, uh, yeah. a but bunch of different, yeah. bunch of different yeah. things. The main so, city council and, and a number of others. And right. Yeah. So, th I mean, I don't think I have studied um, enough on that construction biz. I mean, I, we at the chamber go, had to go through. It took us a year, <laughs> I think. Yeah. It's, it, and we still, I think we just got the permits to do, to redo the chamber's building. So we would have had to go on through that process ourselves. And it is a tedious process. Um, we would have met, we have a working um, relationship with Maine City Council to try and deal with their problems in that department. Mm -hmm. um, we would have met with um, Central Housing and Planning Authority to deal with um, some of the issues over there and see how best we can get that process done. I think they are themselves working because they identify that there is a problem 
in the length of time it takes to get these permits. But uh, like Richard would have said earlier, that um, the interagency and holding their um, holding their own um, and the dependence on each individual agency and whose ever desk it's sitting on uh, is really where it's yeah. the box stops yeah. there. Right. Um, and everybody's fighting for control and nobody's willing to relinquish that control. Kimo, you know, so, one yeah. of the things which you see, any any consultant, any local person involved with, with public governance and public administration systems would know that one of the one of the problems that you experience in Guyana with agencies is a phenomenon called turfing. A lot of them believe that this is their turf and as such you as an agency should have no part to play in this. And that's been one of the things that's caused something called among public among public, public agencies. agencies. And that, that's been one of the one of the problems that has caused something called institutional inertia, resistance to change by institutions. Um, so this and, and you were asking for some we can go through this index by in uh, this index um, dimension by dimension on the matter of dealing with construction permits uh, one of the very low hanging fruits for this one that we rank 167 out of 180 90. countries 190 countries thereabouts very low one of them is to have a national committee of interagency to coordinate construction permits mm -hmm. an interagency committee that deals with these construction permits at the highest level um, from different from multiple stakeholders that allows for all of the agencies to understand the work of each other um, particularly with the oil and gas sector now you know one with CHNPA, the Mayor and City Council, the Lands and Surveys Commission, the Fire Service, GWI, all of them sitting around the table and talking. Um, starting a business is another one. Another one that we ranked 111, and that's a low-hanging fruit too. If you talk to young persons, young entrepreneurs um, who have these ideas, perhaps they're at the University of Guyana in SEBI, um, you would find that many of them, they don't even know where to go to gather information. How much of the process is actually digitized? How much of the process is user-friendly? Are, are there uh, booklets and pamphlets available at the right places for those who are entrepreneurs? Um, you see, the, the whole thing about it is that we have to foster an entrepreneurial culture. And to do that, information has to be there as well as information has to be relayed. Um, I'm not sure, do you want us to go through the index dimension yeah, by dimension? Before you continue, you said that CHP was somewhat receptive of your, your pointing out that there is an issue and how long it takes and how, how tenuous the process is. Um, what, what have they done in your knowledge to try to ease this, ease when, this issue. When we met with CHNPA, they indicated um, this that they understand those those issues, and they were working at that time actively to start the interagency committee um, that I would have mentioned Mention. to you. Mm -hmm. So I am unsure of whether that interagency committee has commenced its work, but I can tell you that that committee, once implemented and once it becomes a technical working group. Uh, would certainly speed up the rate at which uh, things are done. One of the other very important dimensions here that we must discuss as an overarching one yeah. is the integration and digitization of many of these public agencies. You'd be surprised how many agencies do not have digital records and how many of them do not have it integrated amongst uh, agencies that do the work. So, you know, we're living way past the third industrial revolution and the I, what we call the ICT revolution. Um, and it is about time that we begin to move and modernize the public service so that it becomes uh, business friendly and up to, up to the pace mm -hmm. in terms of doing business. Okay. Now, I don't expect us to go through all of the indicators on the index. I, I wanted to point out... Um, particularly the getting electricity indicator <laughs> because this is something that's an issue that's played Ghana for years and years. We would have 
engaged, I think, was when the new director, well, before he came on, and then when he came on, the new um, CEO of GPL, we would have engaged, the chamber would have engaged and created a working group with him, which, I mean, it's quite busy. We didn't get to, we don't meet with him as often as we would like. Um, to deal, to address some of these issues, he would have indicated to us initially that he would try to reduce that time. Right. Um, because he himself would acknowledge six months for a meter for a business is ridiculous. For getting a permit to... Mm. Yeah, to get a permit to, or even... Getting a meter. Getting, getting a, a meter. meter right. Um, even the inspection permits um, takes a while. Um, but we have um, members of the chamber that have electrical businesses and they sometimes um, have to go pick up... Um, inspectors and take them with their own vehicle to do inspections because there's a lack of um, transportation or wa or a vehicle available for some of these things a lot of agencies that we we know um, that is the problem you know they're on the staff mm -hmm. they're on the um, equipped uh, we had that several times so we were dealt with um, the issues with food and drug um, same pesticide board, not enough um, inspectors, um, and also I think there's Ministry of Public Infrastructure and their department that deals with um, permitting homes. So you have all these agencies and a lot of them are, on, I mean, it's a growing economy, a growing country, and, and it's growing faster than these agencies can grow. Mm -hmm. And we really need to look at it and see how do we can start eroding the, the, this excessive amount of time. I mean, six months, as I would say, six months to, to get your meter installed, and then the time before you can get a permit to get that is ridiculous. So six months to get your meter installed, and then I understand that for construction permits, it could take years. It can take years. So it's, it's a hell of a lot of time to get your business started and to even get it operationalized. You didn't, this index didn't even take into consideration um, one of the most troubling ones, uh -huh. um, getting land. <laughs> um, that's almost an impossible thing to do. Um, I don't, I mean, I, I could tell you the businesses in the chamber. I mean, it's impossible when you're local to get land unless you're a very big company, but, um, and you, but I mean, you got foreign companies coming in and getting 700 acres of land and didn't, weren't even registered as a business. Um, you know, we've had members of our chamber we would have discussed that applied ag big, um, I should say, manufacturers in the agro sector and they have applied for land to do to that boost. That specific business, um, coconut farming? Yeah, coconut farming, among other things that they were doing, that sector, that, that company that we were talking about, about four years ago, they applied, and they're still waiting. Have small businesses in in the sector that are trying. I I've got a very good friend of mine who has a small business, and he's picking up and he's you know and he he's doing his thing and he applied put together a whole package and everything applied for land and then you're telling him twenty eight million dollars or twenty three million dollars an acre. Um, he needs about three acres, and that alone plus a medium a small to medium sized business. Uh, to pay that back, especially the, and I think we would have the idea getting credit mm -hmm. is on the right. index, getting credit and credit and dealing with, um, dealing with this here, um, it's another crazy matter by itself. I mean, you're looking at the interest rates at the minimum, if you're a really good borrower at 8%, I mean, and as high 16 and it could go, and if you don't have good credit, it could go as much as 21 and 23 percent. How could we be competitive when some of the margins, especially if we're borrowing money um, to do a, um, something that is very competitive and, and the margins are maybe one and two percent, you know, so yeah. we really have to look at it.
you said that there are certain foreigners who might get land quicker than locals who have applied years and years ago. What have you observed would be the things that get you a shoe in to be allocated land? I would not be able to say. I just read the, I read the Kaichor news and see that um, they're getting <laughs> land uh, when I open the front page. <laughs> but um, many times... Um, we are told, I could tell you what, what I've been told, um, don't call me, I'll call you. That's basically what, I think I got a picture of the letter. Okay. But um, those are some of the things that you end up getting and facing. Um, we know that oh, there's no land available in Region 4. There's no land available um, anywhere close by. Um, and you, we get that, I mean, or we get no response. Mm. And from, yeah. from your observation, it, there tends to be a skewer towards foreigners. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess the, the capital investment that they're coming with, it, um, it propels the people to um, act faster and to capture that foreign direct investment that is coming. Um, that's the only thing I could assume that is mm. propelling them to do that. Okay, well, yeah. You see, many of these issues, we can't view them one in isolation and we can't just observe one end of them. Let's take for example the electricity one. JPL faces 40% commercial and technical losses. That in turn affects their, their financial performance and how they are able to uh, adequately supply uh, electricity to right. the country, which is a major problem in terms of not just the reliability but also the quality of electricity. Um, if we look at land, so, so obviously just GPL, you obviously have to have mechanisms in place to deal with that quantum of uh, technical and commercial losses that can accrue. If we look at uh, the allocation of lands, w do we have a national land use policy? Are we developing in a, not an ad hoc manner, but in a, synch a synchronous manner, in a manner that is planned, in a manner that allocates various plots of land and different zones, etc., for uh, commercial or industrial use, is that being made public and is that being made clear? Um, you know, sometimes, in with many of these problems, it's not even so much as the problem that exists or the system, but rather the signals that are being sent and how transparent a process is. Because if one can understand that, okay, we are going to allocate land for the development of certain priority sectors, and we know that an investor, whether local or foreign, comes to invest in a certain priority sector, um, and he is granted the land, he or she is granted the land, then we know that it has been done in a manner in accordance with some type of policy. But are we seeing uh, transparent policies? Are we seeing policies that are being guided by development planning? Are we seeing policies um, that allow for fairness and equity in terms of access to land? Those are critical questions which we need to ask regarding the sector. Um, so, like I said, these problems and these uh, areas which we see in the doing business index they can't be viewed from just one side they have to be viewed for what they are multi-dimensional problems now what i want to say about this doing business index there's often times a lot of reference to the index and and uh, where we stand and what rank and and so on but we as Guyanese and and those in positions of influence have to look at this index and look at the different dimensions but understand it within the local context and begin to use it to guide development planning. These are issues when we benchmark it globally, this is where we stand and how do we address it. We have to begin to think of ways in which we can uh, address many of these low-hanging ones, whether it's through information, whether it's through digitization, whether it's through uh, collaborative work, etc., um, the ones that don't require a lot of infrastructure and capital expenditure, let's work on those. And we have to not only plan, but plan the, the, the sequence in which we'll do this. But you got, I mean, you have to look at it. And this is why it's important to have those national um, committees that, that brings a number of industry, um, I should say, organizations and together to do this. Because when you have a national, when you have a plan, right, 
and you have the private sector involved in molding and sh helping to shape your country and not do it in isolation, right? right? Invite us to the table so we will know your plan and we don't, we're not left in the dark. We know that it doesn't make sense I applying for a piece of land to do this when this is not what you're going to be doing in this area. Okay. So, and, and it's quite important. I mean, this is why you need um, the, the, the GIS specialist to plan your urban planning, get your areas. You, I mean, not go and develop a piece of land and then you build something behind it and then you change your mind and you add another area and then you do this and then there's no road. No. So mm -hmm. most countries will build a road from A to B and then everybody will develop around it. In Ghana, we seem to be building yeah. areas and then figure out how we're going to do the road. Much, too much in terms of yeah. ad hoc type of So you, that's where you right. need to, to, to get the inclusiveness of all the players at the table. Now, I think we've spoken a lot about this doing business index and I don't want to bore people. Let's mm -hmm. move off of that. Um, we have an international petroleum summit coming up. GPEX, and the chamber has announced that it's launching a business directory. What's the purpose of this business directory? Right. So thanks, Kimal, for that question. It gives me a wonderful opportunity to discuss the work of the chamber. The Georgian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, as you know, we have a number of members, um, over 300 members. And we believe that we need to utilize this opportunity to showcase the capacity of the Chamber of Commerce, mm -hmm. what businesses we have, who we are, and what we can do for persons. It's essentially going to be um, what a directory is, who the persons are, what, what their contact information is, um, and you have different advertorials in there that not only discuss businesses, but what those businesses can do, as well it, as it has a lot of the common questions which are asked about the Chamber what the chamber is, how to join the chamber, what the chamber can do for you, um, and such the like. We are going to be launching the business directory of the Chamber of Commerce on Wednesday night at the oral launch. Uh, that's at the roof of Pegasus. Attendance is free for any uh, private sector company that is a member of a business support organization. Mm -hmm. um, or if you have been interfacing with the chamber, for example, attending our events, etc., our business development forums or various mixes, or any delegate that is registered for GPEX. Um, so the business directory is a great opportunity. I can tell you uh, it's been the reception to it by our members has been incredible, and it's just one other publication in the catalog of the Chamber of Commerce that showcases its membership. Um, and really gives an opportunity for those persons within the GCCI to put their product and put their brand out there. Okay. I want to thank you, the viewers and the listeners, for joining us tonight. We've had a very, very extensive conversation about barriers to doing business in Guyana, who's about to start producing oil probably next month or maybe January if the weather is bad. <laughs> and all of this, I'd say this World Bank Doing Business Index, it's really a judgment of you know, local businesses want to start up, they want to operate, they want to get into the oil sector and we're also encouraging international businesses to come and invest but if we want that we have to set the framework first and that's really what this conversation is about um i'd like to thank you gentlemen for joining me tonight and i do want to have you back for another segment because there's a lot more that yeah. we can talk about certainly. Certainly. certainly thank you for having us okay, well, just um can i just plug shamelessly one more thing before <laughs> i leave sure. um i just want to encourage persons out there who have businesses that are registered, businesses who are not members of the Chamber of Commerce, to join the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Mm -hmm. It's a very simple process. You can simply type into Google GCCI application form, yeah. um, your business registration, uh, TIN certificate, NIS registration and or compliance, and one paragraph about your business. Fill the form and submit it. 
um, and that's 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 it. You become a member of this community of businesses, and it's one window. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Ease so, of joining the chamber. <laughs> that's it, folks. Um, you are listening to Petroleum One Hundred and One. My name is Kimal King, your host, and I want to say a uh, very good night to you all. Serving up Guyana's most healthy diet of information and entertainment. Indulge all you want with Kaichur Radio. 99.1 FM. Kaichur Radio. The radio.